Welcome to this special installment of Zoom with COA entitled Biden's Upcoming Appeasement, Iran Deal is a Deadly Threat to Israel and the World and It Must Be Stopped, featuring Brigadier General Amir Avivi with an introduction by ZOA Board Chair David Schoen. Q&A is going to be moderated by ZOA Government Relations Director Dan Pollack. This is a ZOA National Board and Donor Society event. I'm Alan Jay, National Director of Outreach and Engagement at ZOA. Thank you for joining us for this timely and vitally important program. All microphones should remain muted for the duration of the program. There will be Q&A at the end of the program, moderated again by Dan Pollock, ZOA Government Relations Director. We will not be monitoring the Zoom chat, so all questions must be submitted in the, ZO in the Zoom Q&A feature found in the middle bottom of your screen. As those in attendance today are our most generous donors, I don't need to spend time telling you what you already know about ZOA. I will tell you that it seems like now more than ever, ZOA finds ourselves absolutely alone in advocating for Israel's legal rights, the ability to defend herself, and even as today's webinar will point out, in the arena of strenuously challenging the current administration's strategy to re-engage Iran in some iteration of yet another disastrous nuclear deal, that would have catastrophic impact on Israel, the Middle East, and the entire world. Our advocacy needs to grow, so I do ask that you continue to support ZOA as generously as you possibly can. David Schoen received his Master's of Law from Columbia University School of Law. David is a prominent civil rights and constitutional attorney who regularly litigates First Amendment cases, police misconduct cases, and the rights of all people. Upon receiving an award from the American Bar Association, the inscription quoted federal judges and reads, Mr. Schoen's litigation has been responsible for effecting more positive change in public institutions in the South, including jails, prisons, foster care, education, indigent defense, et cetera, than the work of any other lawyer of this era. David is also known for his groundbreaking legal work combating the Palestinian Authority PLO's efforts to avoid liability for their role in the murder of innocent Jews and Americans. Mr. Schoen uncovered the Palestinian Authority's PLO pay to slave programs operations and terrorist organization Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine's role on the PLO Executive Committee. David also helped moderate a United Nations panel on the glorification of terrorism. Here's a little known fact. David also co-founded the ZOA Center for Law and Justice which now under the direction of Susan Tuckman, among other things, does vital work defending and protecting the civil rights of Jewish and pro-Israel students on college campuses. And with all that he has accomplished, we at ZOA are most proud and indebted to David for agreeing to chair our national board. Here to introduce our very special guest, ZOA board chair, David Schoen. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, it's a great honor to be here today. In fact, I thought this was so important that I'm in the middle of a trial, but I got the judge to take a break. You can see I'm here in the courtroom. Um, it's a tremendous honor to have uh, General Amir Avivi here with us today on this most timely subject. Um, a true expert on a, an issue that's of tremendous interest to us and to everyone in the world, every thinking person in the world, at least. Um, General Avivi is the founder and the CEO of Habitronistim, the um, Israel's Defense and Security uh, Forum, it's called in English. Um, it's a group of high-ranking, former high-ranking uh, officers in the IDF, experts in the field of uh, security, international security, Israel security, who have put together what I would think of as a think tank, but uh, with real action uh, programming. Um, General Avivi retired from the IDF in 2017, uh, more than 30 years experience countering terrorism, uh, national defense experience, a true expert in the field. Uh, command positions within the IDF, supervise hundreds and hundreds of uh, other officers. Um, he uh, ran the Corps of Engineers. He deputy division commander, head of the military school of engineers, on and on and on with his credentials. Uh, it would be hard pressed for us to find a greater expert in this field on this very timely subject. Tremendous academic credentials, but uh, let's hear directly from the general. Uh, it's a great honor to have you here, general. Thank you very much, Dan, and uh, thank you for uh, hosting me. It's uh, really an honor. Uh, I am really, really appreciative of what uh, ZOA is doing. Uh, the one voice that we really need today in the States, 
uh, looking overall at all the organizations that I see uh, operating. So thank you all for, for everything uh, you are doing. It's very, very important for, uh, for Israel. Now we are, we are living in, a, I would say one of the most uh, crucial uh, moments, I think in the, the history of Israel. And I can say that in all of my 30 years of service, and I've been in quite a lot of operations and wars, I've never felt so worried uh, about what's to come, what, what is going to happen in the next uh, year or two. And, and I want to explain uh, really what the situation is and, and how it's affecting uh, Israel and, and, and the future of Israel, and of course, connected to the topic to connect it to the Iranian uh, issue. Uh, first of all, I would say that for uh, quite a long time, it started of course uh, in Obama's administration, uh, we see a tendency of the US uh, to want to be less involved in uh, what's going on in the, in the Middle East. Uh, we saw lately the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which was the way it was done, especially it was devastating because at the moment, all over the Middle East, all the Sunni radical elements are getting stronger. I'm talking about ISIS, I'm talking about Al Qaeda, um, the, the terror attack, by the way, that was carried out uh, yesterday in Beersheba was a guy that was inspired by ISIS and uh, conducted a terrible attack with uh, four people uh, killed. Um, so on one hand, we have these uh, radical Sunni elements like Hamas, uh, uh, this, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Al-Qaeda, ISIS getting stronger after this withdrawal. And at the same time, we see the Iranians spreading all around us they have been working a long time to build the, all their militias around Israel. We know we have uh, in the north Hezbollah with uh, more than 100,000 rockets and uh, Hezbollah in the last decade grew from 50 UAVs to 2000. Now imagine what it means, 100 UAVs that cross the Israeli border and within minutes, uh, attack uh, the port of Haifa, for example. This is something very problematic to deal with. I can tell you that the US forces in Iraq and, uh, and in Syria are, are having a, a lot, a lot of uh, difficulties to deal with UAV attacks. We saw this UAV attacks also in the, uh, against the Gulf states and Saudi Arabia. Uh, some of the attacks came directly from Iran, some came from uh, Yemen. So we see the growing force of uh, Hezbollah. At the same time, we see Hamas that is also funded by Iran and Islamic Jihad building a capability of tens of thousands of uh, rockets. Some 4,000 of them were shot in the last operation in May. Uh, some of them reached Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. And there is a buildup of force also in Syria and in Iraq and Yemen. I, I don't know if you know that, but in May, during the operation, Iran tried to launch missiles against Israel from Iraq and from Yemen. So they are building a force also uh, in this area. Iran has a very clear goal. They want to reach in two years about a capability that will include about 300,000 rockets with at least a thousand uh, uh, very accurate missiles with thousands of UAVs, with forces near our border, especially on the Lebanese war, but also in Gaza that are able to attack and conduct short uh, attacks uh, on towns along the border. And they wanna launch all of this. At the same time, there is a buildup of uh, a force inside Israel. We saw in May um, the ability of the Hamas to mobilize Israeli Arabs to conduct pogroms against Jews in mixed cities in Jerusalem, in the Negev, to, to get Arabs to close main roads and create a situation where Jews cannot get out of their towns. 
Um, so when I look at what, what would it would it look like the next uh, uh, war, it will include two main things. Uh, Iran attacking from all fronts, north, south, east, with rockets and missiles and UAVs, and at the same time, an uprising of Israeli Arabs and Palestinians in Judea and Samaria, uh, and um, conducting attacks inside Israel, disrupting the ability of the IDF to, to concentrate its forces along, along the borders. Now, how all of this connects to what is happening now? Iran has been under quite severe sanctions for a long time. And although they were under sanctions, they managed uh, to build up quite, build up quite a, a big force and they're continuing to build it, build it up. If an agreement is signed in the coming weeks between the US and Europe, uh, and Russia, China with Iran, the consequences will be as following. First of all, they will relieve the sanctions. Relieving the sanctions will give Iran immediately $100 billion. So just to, to understand the numbers, we, we are getting um, aid from the US between three to four, uh, four billion dollars. I'm talking about $100 billion. And with $100 billion, they will exponentially uh, grow uh, the ability to, to grow their forces around Israel um, and will reach very, very fast uh, the, the point where they will feel they can attack us. Uh, the other thing is that this agreement has uh, no real tools for inspection, meaning that they will continue uh, full speed to, to try and reach the nuclear capability. Now they are looking at uh, the history of Libya and the history of Ukraine. They saw that when Libya gave up uh, their nuclear capabilities, this was almost immediately followed by an, by an attack of uh, NATO that uh, assisted the rebels uh, against Gaddafi, and everybody saw on TV how Gaddafi life ended up. The same is happening to Ukraine. Ukraine in uh, 1994 willingly gave up its biggest asset, it was nuclear weapons. Uh, they got promises from Britain, from the US, and even from the Russians that uh, nobody will attack them. And look what is happening now. The, the, the Ukrainian state is completely destroyed. It wouldn't have happened. There is no chance that somebody would have invaded Ukraine if they had nuclear weapons. And the Iranians understand that. They understand that if they want this regime, this terrible regime to, to, to survive, they need nuclear weapons. So this is why they are determined to, to move uh, forward with this plan. Uh, with enrichment, and, and we have to remember that this, the, the JCPOA, this agreement is, is basically saying that within a few years, the agreement will end. And once it ends, it gives the Iranians the ability to enrich endless amount um, of materials. So basically they will be able in five years to produce uh, and reach uranium to such a de degree that will enable them to procure something like a hundred bombs. This is, will completely change the world. Now the agreement doesn't at all deal with the project of the missiles, meaning they are building missiles that can reach the US. Uh, obvious, of course they can reach Europe and of course they can reach Israel. And then all they'll have to do is put these bombs on the, on the missiles and, and that's it. Now, this is a regime that is saying very clearly what they wanna do. They want to annihilate Israel. And this is a regime that will be willing to, to use these weapons. They have no problem doing that. And 
And, and of course, what, what will happen once this agreement is signed, and it's obvious that they basically got on paper the permission to be a nuclear power, this will create proliferation. The Saudis, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Gulf states, they will all start a race for uh, developing or procuring uh, nuclear weapons. The, the Saudis are ready with agreements with Pakistan. The moment that the Iranians are moving finally towards a nuclear weapon, the Saudis are going to bring uh, nuclear weapons from Pakistan and the whole Middle East will change. Now we have to remember that this uh, area is, 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 is not stable. States fall apart. Uh, you have uh, many terror organizations. So once this proliferation uh, starts, uh, it's just a matter of time until terror organizations uh, will hold nuclear bombs. Um, so basically what we feel in Israel, first of all, I must say that I've al always been a man of real politic every time something big happened in the world, I was always able to look at it and understand what are the interests behind it. I understand the interests of Russia when they're attacking Ukraine. I can agree or disagree and think that it's terrible to do, but I really understand what are the interests, why they're doing that. Um, if there is something I'm really failing to understand, there is no logical explanation for what the US is doing with Iran. This complete surrender to this uh, terrible regime, it's, it's completely illogical. I, I think that there's something that we don't understand. It doesn't make sense. It's obvious that the US is pushing the Middle East towards a terrible war. And it's pushing Israel to, to a place where we, we will have to, to react. We will not be able to sit and wait for Iran to be nuclear. We will have to, to take our future in our hands and attack. Now, I, I've um, been in two positions in the, in the army where I saw very closely the preparations. I was at the camp of the chief of general staff and I was the chief auditor of all of the Israeli defense establishment in my last position. So I monitored very carefully the preparations for such a scenario. And, and I can tell you, Israel is preparing. It's preparing for a scenario where we have to, to, to defend ourselves and attack Iran. Now it's, it's obvious um, that uh, if, if we attack, they will retaliate by using all the militias and shooting Israel. So there is no operation in Iran without a full-scale war in the north, in the south, towards the east, and maybe inside Israel. And, and this is something that Israel needs to be uh, preparing for. This is basically the scenario. So um, I think that uh, Many people in Israel understand, at least my organization understands that we need to start moving in a completely different pace. We need to invest much more in our security apparatus and we need to be proactive. We need to decide to, what, what we want to do. We cannot just sit and wait uh, until, uh, until this happens. And it's a big dilemma, what to do. First attack Iran, first uh, destroy Hezbollah, first uh, take care of Hamas, maybe deal first of all with the Bedouins in the Negev and uh, what's going on in Jerusalem and so on. Uh, it's not a simple uh, issue to decide upon, but one thing is sure, we, we need to be much more prepared. And certainly if uh, sanctions will be lifted, we will have also to invest huge, huge amounts of money uh, to try to, to cope with the race that is going to happen here. So if anybody is impressed by the fact that Israel got a billion dollars um, for Iron Dome, I'm not impressed. I'd rather not have this billion dollars and, and rather have a partner that uh, understands that uh, sanctions need to be 
uh, impose them that we need to deal with Iran the way Iranians understand, and they understand only force. The only thing that can stop Iran is something that uh, will make them feel that the regime might not might not uh, hold on. And this is all very severe sanctions and with very uh, strict inspection and the uh, demand to dismantle all of uh, these sites that are at the moment enriching uranium or a military attack. And, and, and I must say that I don't understand why a power like the US um, is worried about needing to conduct such an attack. Destroying the capabilities of Iran, it, it can be done from the air. There is no need for um, operating on the ground as the US did in Iraq or in Afghanistan. It's a completely different issue. And it's not something complicated. And by the way, the unwillingness of the US to deal with this issue is also affecting the deterrence the US is losing against Russia and China. When Russia sees that the US is not even willing to deal with a weak country like Iran compared to the US, and Iranians have, are, 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 are very aggressive and are shooting military sites of the US around the Middle East, pushing the US out of Iraq and Syria and so on. When the US doesn't retaliate to that and doesn't attack Iran, this gives the message to Russia, we, you know, we can do whatever we want. And this is part of what is happening uh, now is in Ukraine. The only way to try to bring back deterrence and try to stabilize what's going on around the globe is a very, very strong uh, approach against Iran. And Iran is not a very strong country. It's a country that uh, can, we can deal with, especially if we join hands, the US with Israel and uh, with the Arab uh, Sunni countries. I'm sure you noticed that in the last uh, week or two, the chief of staff of Israel visited the Gulf states. We even met with the chief of staff of Qatar, which is quite a big deal. Qatar wasn't uh, for a long time a very friendly uh, state to Israel. Also, uh, the prime minister is now in a meeting with the Egyptians and the Saudis and the Turks um, are starting to get uh, closer to us. So we can see quite a lot of uh, changes. The Sunni world is understanding that uh, what's happening with Iran is devastating for everybody and that we need to get uh, closer uh, together. And this is what is happening. So having said all of that, I would be happy to answer questions. OK, this is Dan Pollack. I'm the Director of Government Relations. Um, the first question goes to our introducer, David Schoen, if he has one. David, you're still muted. Can we get you unmuted? Yeah. Okay. I, I say I don't really have any questions. I just want to say how tremendously grateful we are to have this presentation. It was a chilling and scary presentation, but that's what true friends do. I, I think it's remarkable how honestly, candidly, and vividly uh, General Avivi presented. Uh, the U.S. position and how wrong that position is on these issues. And again, that's what a true friend does. They point out those issues. And the U.S. should take that as constructive criticism. I'm worried because we have the people who originally negotiated the Iran deal back in office uh, and back involved with the negotiations. But I, I don't have any question. I mean, General Avivi said it all as far as I'm concerned. Thank you very much. Okay, we do have some questions from um, attendees, but I wanted to start out with um, just reminding everyone, we'd rather you put the questions in the Q&A tool. A couple of people put questions into the chat, which is a little bit more difficult to manage. So please Q&A questions. The first one is um, about, one second, just prioritizing these. So in the United States, many of us are familiar with what other American Jewish organizations and in the diaspora are doing. And their reaction has not been 
um, to prioritize the issue of Iran in the way that ZOA has. And the question for you is, what do you think about the reaction of diaspora Jewry and American Jewry in particular? And obviously ZOA is doing everything we can to raise the profile of this issue, but what is your impression of the way the American Jewish community is responding so far? Well, I, I would certainly uh, like to see more organizations much more involved. And I must say that even in Israel, I mean, when I look uh, at the moment um, at the government that, um, you know, was very willing to take a step in trying to be a mediator between Russia and Ukraine. Um, and I think that the government of Israel needs to be fully centered on Iran. This is the main issue that needs to be dealt with. I don't think we are in a position to mediate between uh, Russia and uh, Ukraine. We, have, we are too involved uh, with the Russians on the northern border. Um, but definitely, I think that uh, in the Jewish world, uh, there is a lot of misunderstanding how grave uh, the situation is. Uh, I, I'm sorry also to see some of our leading uh, generals in other organizations uh, supporting the JCPOA, something that is unbelievable. I mean, I, I don't understand how anybody can support uh, an agreement which basically gives all these uh, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars to Iran and also gives a certificate to be nuclear. This is what's happening. So it's very strange. And I, 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 I'm sorry to see that people make of it something political, you know, discussing about uh, Netanyahu, Bennett, and so on. I, I don't think that this is a political issue. I think that this is a national security issue. It's a real, real threat. We just celebrated Purim now, remembering uh, when the Persians tried to annihilate us many years ago. And this is Purim again. I hope it will end the same way. Uh, we need to be very uh, optimistic and ready for, for such a scenario. But it seems like history has a tendency to repeat itself every few millennia. I'm afraid so. Our next question is from Tyler Korn, one of our national board members. He said, it seems to me that Israel has for years been focusing on its air force and on defensive anti-missile systems, but Israel's enemies have been focusing almost completely on offensive systems, notably rockets and ballistic missiles. Does Israel have a missile gap? Does Israel need to invest more in offensive missile systems? Well, I think that uh, what, what I, I, I am very involved in what's going on now inside the army. Uh, I just came today from reserve um, auditing uh, division in the north. Uh, I can say that I'm mostly worried about how much uh, the IDF is investing in the ground forces. Because as I said before, um, if we attack in Iran, and for this, we are preparing many capabilities, including the Air Force, but many other capabilities that people don't know about. It's not something I can discuss, but I can tell you that for years, we have been developing um, capabilities that are amazing. Uh, Jewish uh, genuity at its best. But at the end of the day, if we use these capabilities, there will be a war on the ground. We cannot cope with 100,000 missiles from Lebanon without very fast operating on the ground and destroying Hezbollah on the ground. There is no way we can do in Lebanon what we are doing in Gaza. Have a week or two weeks of them shooting rockets and us just uh, uh, using Iron Dome and using the Air Force. In, in Lebanon, it simply cannot work. And the, and, and the army knows that. This is why we have plans. All our plans talk about the need to maneuver in Lebanon fast. But this needs a, a lot of investment in the ground forces and they're not getting enough attention because the, the Air Force has become very, very, very expensive buying F-35s and 
all these top capabilities are expensive. And also, of course, all these defense capabilities are important, uh, but also very expensive. So with a limited budget, it's hard to take care of everything. And I think that in that this stage, at least, Israel has no choice but investing more money in its defense establishment to get ready for what's to come. Follow up on that. If there is to be a war in Lebanon, uh, do you think that Israel has been doing enough to prepare the ground with the United States for what the toll will be to the civilian infrastructure in Lebanon? I think it may very well be, you know, really very great devastation in Lebanon due to the way Hezbollah has placed their facilities in civilian areas. And is that something that Israelis should be discussing with the United States and other countries about what the likely outcomes are in Lebanon? Yes, I can tell you that we are doing that a lot, uh, but definitely um, the defense establishment needs to hold this discussion with the government. And you're right, Dan, all, all of the main capabilities of Hezbollah are inside uh, the towns and the cities under civilian infrastructure. And there is no way to deal with that without uh, attacking it. And so it's obviously something that uh, if we come to it, uh, we'll need to do. Uh, in some ways, when you do it on the ground, it's easier to digest than you do it uh, just from the air. So, you know, I would say this, when you start a big war, you have a few weeks to, to, to do what you need to do, but you need to do it fast because at a certain stage, people get, uh, the world gets fed up and wants to stop it. We are not Russia. Russia can do whatever it wants for as long as it wants. This is not the case for Israel. Agreed. So we have a question from our national board vice chairman, Paul Tartel. If the worst case scenario, JCPOA 2.0, does get executed and becomes policy, can Israel act independently? What repercussions would be expected? Well, first of all, yes, Israel understands that uh, it might need to act by, by itself. It's, it's not the best scenario. I would be much happier to see the US and Israel uh, acting together, but this is not the reality. And the repercussions are very simple, full-scale war. It will be full-scale war. And this is why I said that in all my years in the, in the military, I've, I've never felt so worried about what's to come because i'll tell you this when, when you look at the history of israel the way our national security developed before we became a state uh, it was considered a, a fight between neighbors we saw the arab uprisal in the former century in the 30s um, we saw this tension, very strong tension on the civilian side between Arabs and Jews. They, we were building our country and the Arabs were very upset about that. Then when we became a state in 48, it became big wars, like the independence war and the six day war and the 73 war and 56 and so on. And then it became a um, small scale uh, operation. What we are facing now is all of these three together. We are facing what we were facing before the, the country was established, but this time the Arabs are having the upper hand. Zionism is completely stopped. They are taking uh, areas, they are building, we are uh, on retreat and this is very, very bad. And of course, uh, when, you, when you have a government that is not even with the Zionist majority, it's even worse. But it didn't start now with this government. For the last two decades, Zionism has stopped. We are not leading uh, um, the Zionist uh, enterprise. I mean, if I could say if, um, 15 years ago that time is benefiting the Jews, I can say now that inside Israel, time is benefiting the Arabs. And we need to change that and fast. 
part of the establishment of my organization is to do this change, to, to impact Israeli society and move it uh, towards a Zionist enterprise. Uh, this is very much, uh, very much needed. Thank you. Um, so we have, we have a lot of work ahead of us. We have a question from Donald Lewin, who is a great supporter and friend of the ZOA. We really appreciate his support. He wants to know, why does the US want any deal with Iran? Does it want to commit suicide? Similarly, why does any Israeli military officer seek to support the deal? Which of course, I'm sure that you're not speaking in support of either the current deal or the proposed new deal, just to be clear. Go ahead. Okay, so um, first of all, I'll answer the second part, and, I, and I'll say that um, because Israel has become uh, throughout the years so dependent on, on American aid, there is a whole group of generals that um, really feel that they want to be strongly connected to the administration, any administration. And um, they are behaving as if we are the 51 state of the US and not a sovereign country. And with a tendency to support any, anything that the administration uh, wants to, uh, to push forward. Uh, looking it, at it from an American uh, point of view, as I said at the beginning, I cannot understand what, uh, why this is happening. I, I can say, that one thing for sure changed that enables this. Uh, the US since uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a, a very strong uh, relations with Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states because the US needed oil from the Sunni world. So as long as the US had this dependency on oil, it needed to be to side with the Sunnis um, and then the Iranians were, were left aside. At, when Obama stepped into office, it was the first time in history of the US that the US became completely uh, independent uh, and didn't need any more oil from the Middle East. This is due, due to the fracking industry and the amount of oil that was produced. And in one day, all this Sunni world became almost irrelevant. Now, the moment there was no dependency, the, the eyes, usually the, the president of the United States looks at a region like, uh, like the Middle East is, okay, who, who are the strong guys? Who are the guys that are looking to step up as the strong nation? Now we want to ally with them. Just to give you an example of this kind of thinking, we should go back to 47. You know, before the state of Israel was established, we Jews were very, very uh, weak. And when the US had to decide if to, to vote for a Jewish state or not, the State Department, um, and also the, uh, the defense establishment in the US said it very clearly, we are against the Jewish state. And this knowing that 6 million Jews died in, in, in the diaspora, in, in the Holocaust, why? Because they needed the, the alliance of the Arabs. And the same happened after the um, independence war. When, when we were asked to retreat from the Galilee, from the Negev and we refused, we were imposed with a military embargo. When did it change? It changed in 67, why? because we became strong. So the lesson is very simple. You want to be relevant? You want states to ally with you? Be strong, that's it. If you are not strong, they will step on you. Even the US, I am not the kind of guy that, you know, people tend to talk, yes, we have common values. And I don't believe in all these things. I believe in real politics. I mean, you know, when, when we talk, we educate the, the young generation in Israel, I always ask them, how do they picture the world? Is it the imagine of uh, John Lennon or the Game of Thrones? <laughs> and I think it's closer to the Game of Thrones than the imagine of John Lennon. I hope when we see what's going on in Ukraine now, it's obvious in the Iranians and so on. 
The other thing that's obvious, I think, is that Israel has to rely on itself for its defense. Ultimately, Definitely. that's a great lesson. So you talked about what might happen if we move forward with this new version of the JCPOA. I wanted to talk to you about what might happen if, if that doesn't happen for whatever reason. I am very concerned that uh, some people are relying on Iran observing the old agreement, which first of all, they're not doing totally. And secondly, it, it inevitably leads if there are really very few constraints on Iranian behavior today, and they are enriching uranium as we speak to levels approaching that needed for several nuclear bombs, not just one. And I am not convinced that Israeli diplomacy has a clear um, formula in the event that Iran does not agree to a new agreement. And I, I fear that it will still have to lead to a kinetic action, even if there isn't a new agreement that Israel would not be a party to. So I, I tell you what I'm wishing for, and maybe also what I expect from the ZOA, and maybe something that we can do together in the, in the States. There is one hope, I, one thing I'm hoping for. I cannot hope for a change in the Biden administration. I don't think it's going to change. Uh, but I can hope that maybe we can stall uh, this process until at, at least two years, hoping that there will be a different administration uh, in two years. Um, and uh, if we manage to do this, we need to spend the next two years doing two things. Israel needs to prepare for war. And we need to work very hard uh, with our supporters on Congress and Senate, explaining that at this stage, really, there is only one way to go, and it's attacking the military installations of Iran. And I, I'm hoping that um, the next administration will be favorable to Israel, and I'm hoping it will be an administration that will be willing to, to attack with us um, and destroy all, the, all of the capabilities of Iran. We, we have no choice. And, and we, need, we really, really need to use this uh, two years to, to try and, uh, and bring this understanding because talking is over. There is not, nothing to talk anymore with the Iranians. The Iranians are moving towards a bomb and really we are left only with one real choice uh, to stop this. And, and it's not good for Israel to do it alone. I mean, if we have to, we'll do it, but it's not the best thing that I, I would like to, ha to happen. So we really need to speak uh, and, 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 and create this preparedness now, because if we wait two years and then start talking about it, it's too late. So one of our questioners asks, does the general have any confidence whatsoever that any of Israel's peace partners who are also threatened by Iran would help Israel to mitigate or defeat Iran? Well, um, i say this, you know, we had amazing relationships with the Iranians and we'll see what's going on now. We had very good relationship with the Turks and we saw how this last few years uh, turned out. We have good relations with some of the Sunni states. It's not because they lack us. It's because they're threatened by Iran and the threat is existential. As long as this uh, interest will exist, they will go along and cooperate with us. The minute there will be no common interests, uh, things will change as uh, it happened with Iran and with, uh, with Turkey. So we need, when we look at these peace agreements, it, it, it looks great and we're trading and we're flying and we're talking and everything is fine, but we need to be, to understand that it's, it's not for sure that this will continue in the future. Uh, already now, by the way, the Saudis and the Gulf states are having talks with Iran because they are not sure they can rely only on Israel. If, if, if they will con be convinced that uh, America is completely out of uh, the equation, there would actually in uh, some scenarios we will go with Iran. 
So it's complex. The situation is very complicated. And uh, this is why the US really needs to come to its senses when we are dealing with the Middle East. Okay, we have a question from uh, Paul Cruz, um, who's on our Florida ZOA board, I believe. Um, he just met with uh, Nir Barquette, and he was very impressed with his accomplishments and vision and knowledge. How do you assess the future of the Likud party? And what do you think needs to happen for them to come back to power, including Bibi's role in doing so? I suspect you as a general, you probably don't wanna to get too involved in Israeli politics. Yeah, so I'll say this. Um, my organization has met uh, Barkat in the last um, six months, I think 17 times, something like that. Uh, we are his top advisors uh, talking about national security issues and some of his leading ideas about uh, future solutions with the Palestinians, uh, the ideas we presented to him. Uh, of course, our ideas never compromise Israel or our future. Um, so we're very close contact with uh, many figures in uh, overall in the Knesset. We talk to all the parties. Um, what, what concerns me mainly is the fact that Jews are fighting among themselves and giving the control of the government to the Arabs. This is devastating. And I think that due to the huge challenges that we, we are going to have in the near and long future, there needs to be a completely different government. We need Jews to unite. We need a government that is Zionist, that is patriotic, that cares about the Jews and understands the huge challenges. And we need to get the Arabs out of this coalition uh, because many of the things that are happening now are due to the, the way the government is uh, built. Um, I, I think the Likud needs to decide when um, they want to really change uh, leadership. Um, Netanyahu has done amazing things. He is a very, very able person. But for some reason, many people in Israel are not willing to, uh, many politicians are not willing to, to work with them. And I think that at this stage, the Likud seriously needs to, to start thinking about uh, the next generation uh, of leaders. And Barkat is a great guy. I think he's a very good guy. Uh, good candidate and there are also others which are very good. I think we're close to running out of time. I think it's maybe the last question. Um, do you believe that uh, people who are uh, proponents of the Iran deal, for example, former President Obama, are motivated by uh, uh, anti-Semitism? And does that matter what their motivation is? I think Israel needs to respond whatever the motivation is. Yeah, I think that the way Obama uh, behaved with Israel, especially in his last days, how obsessed he was to hurt Israel, it was inconceivable. And, and, and you know, people in Israel, some tried to, to explain it because of his relationship with, um, with Netanyahu. I, I think that he really has an issue with us. Um, and uh, there is a big difference between the soft uh, talking and what's going on in, in his mind. And I don't, I'm not an, at all an expert in American politics, but uh, from, from what I hear, he probably is still a figure that is affecting policy in the Democratic Party. And therefore maybe it doesn't come as a surprise that uh, this administration is pushing this devastating uh, agreement with Iran, endangering the whole region, especially Israel. Well, we really want to thank you for your time. Um, we uh, wanted to particularly thank Cheryl Silver, who asked a question, but apparently I didn't get to see it. Uh, she's a national board member as well. And I apologize, Cheryl. I'm sure it would have been a great question, but I think we run out of time. So here's the things that I have to give at the end of the talk. Uh, we want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, we want to remind you that you may have received just today an alert about a, an event tomorrow. Uh, Philadelphia region is hosting an event at 7 p.m. 
which you have things in your inboxes about, about the institutionalized Jew hatred in Philadelphia. And there was a report by ZOA, which you can read the report and attend an event on tomorrow evening. It's open to everyone. In addition, some of you may know that our national president, Mort Klein, uh, has been involved in some sensitive and um, personal diplomacy with the Turkish ambassador to the United States and for exclusive for certain uh, donors at a high giving level, we're having a meeting on Thursday, March 31st at 3 p.m. And you can contact, if you are interested in attending, uh, Alan J, who was the person at the beginning of the event, at aj, A-J-A-Y, at zoa.org, if you're interested in attending that event. Just a last word, we wanna thank everyone who's on this call because it means you're already committed to helping ZOA. You can see the kind of quality programming we produce and please continue to do what you can to support our organization. With that, I'm going to thank everyone for participating and apologize, it's my fault. Any questions that people put up there that I didn't get a chance to ask correctly and just really thank the general for his time and extremely informative answers. Thank you very much, it was a pleasure. And with that, we're gonna terminate the event. Thank you all.